Hello, Cinefans. I'm Kendall Kruver, and this is Watching Classic Movies. Joan Harrison was one of only three women producing films during the studio age. Also a talented screenwriter, she was instrumental in helping Alfred Hitchcock develop his style on films including Rebecca and Foreign Correspondent, in addition to his long-running television shows. She was key in molding the film noir genre, with movies like The Edgy for Their Time, The Phantom Lady, and They Won't Believe Me. And she also pushed boundaries with several television dramas. I talked about this remarkable filmmaker with my guest, Christina Lane, author of Phantom Lady, Hollywood producer Joan Harrison, the forgotten woman behind Hitchcock. Welcome, Christina. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for having me. I have long understood that Hitchcock had a strong creative partnership with his wife, Alma. The revelation in your book was that it was actually more of a trio for several years and that Joan Harrison was in there. Given her interest in crime that she brought to the table, how, how much do you think she influenced Hitchcock's style. Yeah, I I think she influenced his style a great deal. Uh, I think Joan Harrison came into the you know and kind of into the Hitchcock uh, team and the Hitchcock company at a really important time in his growth. I mean, obviously Hitchcock had been making films you know for a little more than ten years when Joan Harrison joined him in the mid nineteen thirties. She brought this this love of true crime and of lo of literature and reading and um, a sensibility of gothic literature and psychological suspense and also just a sense of what women of you know young girls what they were reading and what young women were watching. So she had a real sensibility of what his viewers tastes were. So having her in the room was was really key, and I believe. As we watch, you know, the, the films that they, they, you know, that he goes on to make, and then of course what she goes on to make, it's it's clear to me that she was was really important in shaping his ideas about about genre and storytelling. And I do agree because I think those years, Rebecca, Foreign Correspondent, Suspicion, Saboteur, the ones where she really worked with him, was where his his style was molded. I think that. She would have been, she would have had a crime podcast or something if she started today. <laughs> yes, I do too. She would have, um, yeah, I actually think she would have really loved, you know, to be alive in this time with this uh, love of true crime and podcasts, for sure. Yes, she would have fit in a great deal. And I, th I do think that I, just before we talked, I was thinking about that, about how their different, their style that they create together goes into different films. Because I, I was watching Nocturne last night, and there's, and, and you know, that stars George Raft, but he's got this mother who's just wonderful. She is also a true crime fiend, and she's, there's this scene where they're talking about crime while they're, you know, having a polite little tea. She, she's talking about crime with a friend, and it reminded me so much of the two men in Shadow of a Doubt who are also obsessed with, with crime stories. I thought this is very similar, even though now that was that after Shadow of a Doubt. I'm trying to think. I think it might have been before. Okay, right, for, uh, and right before Strangers on a Train. It was before Strangers on a Train, um, just by like two years. Two, well, actually by a few more years than that. And I think it's true that she, you know, a lot of the films that she's making right around that time on her own as a producer. In terms of you know Nocturne and the Strange Affair of Uncle Harry and They Won't Believe Me, I think we see Hitchcock coming along right after that, making Rope and Strangers on a Train and some of the films he made in the early 1950s as being really in conversation with with Joan Harrison's movies, and which would make sense because the two of them remained in conversation with one another, you know, throughout the 1940s. But I, I agree that, you know, watching, um, she's not middle-aged. I mean, she is elderly. You know, she's like, she's portrayed as, you know, a much, much older woman, a senior citizen. And then <laughs> with her neighbor, who is also a senior citizen, as they politely drink tea, it's just wonderful when they start. Um, I think it might even be, I, I can't remember how this, you know, whether they, they go together, but right, they, 
they're pulling out the gun and they're, or at least they're pretending to enact how the shots were fired. And it's just delicious the way that we understand their knowledge of forensics, right? <laughs> and it, they're just, there's, they're, she's representative of the kind of character that shows up in Joan Harrison films, whether she writes or produces. I mean, they're not silly. They're not breathy. They don't call themselves girls. They're, they're substantial and perverse and intelligent yeah yeah the women in nocturne are so transgressive and they also help to solve the crime which is important that's true they move the plot forward it's not just this cute little aside i didn't realize i was a joan harrison fan until i caught the blu-ray of they won't believe me that's when i started to catch on that there was somebody special behind these movies that I had liked, like The Phantom Lady and The Strange Affair of Uncle Harry, because she really does have a distinctive style. And I, I think that Ella Raines is, is sort of emblematic of that style. Yeah. So with The Strange Affair of Uncle Harry and also with uh, Phantom Lady, you know, Ella Raines is a character that... And, you know, in both of those films, you know, when she appears on screen, she brings all of these different dimensions. I mean, she's very relatable, you know, I think especially in that time of the early 1940s or the mid 40s, women would have seen her as a very modern urban character that they, you know, they wanted to be, but also they could see themselves sitting next to her, you know, at the movies. At the same time, she was so elegant and so sophisticated and so someone that they would, you know, probably audiences would have projected themselves as, as an ideal. And she, a lot of people have compared her, um, compared the two of them as, 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 you know, like a surrogate for Joan Harrison, just in terms of fashion and style and a real, a, a true professional. So that those women who may have been, say, working in the factories, you know, or working on the war, kind of in that wartime era would have said, oh, wow, you know, like when the war is over, I really, I really hope that I get to, you know, wear that, wear those clothes and, and kind of um, an aspirational figure. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's the glamour that already existed in, in, a, in a role like that. But she adds this, yes, the sharp, modern, kind of self-sufficient kind of air. Right. I think also what you were getting at at the beginning is that She's, I mean, she's got that kind of tough talking, you know, the dame quality that we see with Lauren Bacall, but she's also very knowing. And again, like she helped solve the crime in a, in a way that some of the other women in film noir, they weren't as nearly as active, you know, as, as Ella Rain's characters are. And even in The Strange Affair of Uncle Harry, she's really putting these ultimatums to him and then she's going kind of around his back to talk to his sister and say, look, you're, you're ruining, you're ruining his life and you, you really need to shape up. So she's got um, a lot in terms of depth. She's not passive. Yeah. And you yeah. don't realize how passive a lot of female roles were until you get this run of them. Like, you know, watching a lot of Joan Harrison films, you realize, oh, it really wasn't that way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I, I mean, just to say, right, that, um, you know, I mean, I think we, we see a lot of film noir, and then suddenly we begin to watch how Joan Harrison did film noir, and we say, wow, you know, she was right in the thick of it. You know, she was making them with all, all the men. You know, she was making these films and saying, you know, I want to do these characters differently and some of these tropes differently, and she was managing to do it. You know, I, for me, I'm like, wow, thank goodness we're seeing these films you know, set alongside each other. So now we can kind of say, wow, Joan Harrison was really, as I say in the book, kind of something of a no tour producer, that she had her own, uh, her own signature. And I think that's interesting that, that while she, she did have a hand in the creative process, she really loved being a producer. She, she liked navigating the politics of producing, as I think you, you put in a way, and, 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 and being in the, you know, with the cost cutting and shrewd casting those relationships. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't mind going, you know, kind of going into battle. She, uh, you know, I think we, we, we always stick and therefore maybe more feminine or more, 
again, you know, more artsy, which kind of made sense because she kept talking about wanting her independence. And so maybe, you know, she, I guess the assumption was she wanted more artistic independence. But yeah, everybody that knew her personally said she, she was just, she was like a, you know, a natural producer. And that's because she loved, she loved figuring out how to get, you know, how to solve problems and how to kind of scrap her way through difficult challenges. And right, she, she loved finding locations and, um, uh, you know, and, and working, working with difficult people. That's what I found really funny. Yeah. That, right. She was actually drawn to, to um, difficult, obstinate personalities. And so good for her. Right. I mean, that's just unusual overall. It's, you know, it's re- remarkable for a rem- woman in that time. But yeah, just to have that ability. There, there was somebody who said she wasn't the type of person to let self-doubt get in her way mm-hmm. that you had quoted in the book. And, and I really think that defines her life is that she was so determined to make things happen. I think part of what's interesting about that is how she was willing to go against the grain with her male characters as well, how how she's willing to make um, villains of Franchot Tone and Robert Young, these sweet, adorable guys. Yes. Yeah, so she, you know, she had said when she was making Phantom Lady, right, she said that, um, the one piece of advice that, that Alfred Hitchcock had given her was go against type, especially to, to make um, a good guy, a villain, a villain. So she did that with Rancho Tone in terms of making him, you know, no spoilers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Spoiling thing, but um, to make him, um, he had a fairly, you know, noble characters up to then. Uh, with Phantom Lady, he really does step out and do like a very very exaggerated role <laughs> yes right? in terms of his um his kind of demonic or his his, his mad the, that mad villain character but it's so true like with particularly with they don't they they won't believe me and robert young's character you know so many people like wound up just not enjoying the film they, they didn't actually you know they didn't like the film because he was such a cad and he he pushed the boundaries of what was acceptable and 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 yet you know, as I as I've talked about, especially actually with the Blu-ray version, you see the women through his eyes, right? It's mm-hmm. like an opportunity to to do exploration into these characters of like what kind of woman would be drawn to such a such an awful man? Yeah, and you know, yeah. Well, just that she does a great, you know, she looks at a complicated man and she doesn't do short shrift to to Robert Young's character. And then at the same time, she gives us these three female characters played by Jane Greer and Susan Hayward and Rita Johnson. And every single one of them are so interesting. I do love that she didn't fall into the trap of making one of them a villain. Like she, she, she shows their complexities, like his wife. You know, maybe he finds her in the way, but you can you can feel her pain and understand her point of view. Yeah. And, I, you know, I just going, well, no, not even just going back on tone. I think with both of those roles, I do not shy away from an intense film or an intense portrayal. And I felt very uncomfortable with a lot of those moments. Like, she really taps into some real perversities i keep going back on perversities but real intensities that that even today are you know get under your skin Mm -hmm. what would she have done today i I just i keep thinking that would she do horror i wonder right probably yeah she she was not um yeah she was not one to shy away from things from making people feel uncomfortable and she would really push buttons and uh i think you know i i actually think that's one reason why a lot of her films are not, you know, the, they're not go-to movies, right? They're not the ones that we tend to see on Turner Classic Movies yeah. regularly because they, they're not, they're, they don't aim to wrap things up in a nice, well, I mean, noir doesn't typically, right, wrap things up neatly. Yeah. But even in the way that noir might kind of come out with, or even just kind of a straightforward reversal or um, kind of flipping things on on, on, it, on their end, yeah, she really was quite unconventional in the way that she approached things, mood in terms of mood and tone and story. So that's I do think that's one reason why you know her films have not necessarily stayed in you know kind of in in terms of staying power. I wondered if that were so because the stars are huge, the craft is divine. There's not really anything that should keep you 
with well, something like the strange affair of uncle harry it's a little off kilter in general the story but it's so powerful there's really no other reason but the fact that those characters make you really ill at ease too you know yeah it, right, right. you almost don't want to confront that kind of a person but they're so rich and intriguing that they're certainly worthy of classic status you know i think yeah i think you are onto something with that there's also just well like ride the pink horse the the violence is very intense and 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 at one point it's happening in front of a whole carousel of children yeah i you know with that one in particular i thought how is she getting away with this how did this even make it to theaters yeah I totally agree. I, I think, I mean, we know what kinds of movies were coming out of that time that really did push the edge, you know, in terms of just, you know, you know, Gloria Graham gets coffee, hot coffee thrown in her face, right? You know, and, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and lots and lots of movies that you think, wow, I can't believe they just did that, right? In a lot of different noirs, but, but um, in terms of, uh, in terms of children witnessing violence right there, or um, even P Pila, our character played by Wanda Hendricks at the end of that, just a lot of torture going on. And is it excessive and gratuitous? But Joan Harrison clearly was not one to tone it down. You know, she, if like if there was a way to push it, she would push it. And I'm not sure how she got away with it. I wonder if partly Robert Montgomery's, you know, stature, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, help things to just kind of get pushed through that otherwise might have been questioned. And always there was this um, kind of patina of independence, you know, like the, the critics and the reviewers would basically paint these films as, oh, well, you know, they're, they're almost independent, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah. so they, they, bar they barely got through the production code administration, but this is something a little bit different. So, you know, pa it somehow passes. A little bit on the edge so you can... Yeah, you can pull off a little more. I, I agree about Robert Montgomery because he did have a lot of power. You can see that in the productions he was able to pull off himself. But I, I can also see that if her enjoying the producer role so much and having maybe observed Hitchcock working with the censors, she maybe had a lot of personal <laughs> attributes that helped her to get things by too. Yeah. It, I, I had seen quite a few of the films that Joan Harrison had written and produced by the time I got to your book, but I hadn't seen any of the television shows. Mm -hmm. And again, oh my gosh, there's some intense. You know, I haven't I haven't been able to dig in too much, but okay. So Janet Dean, registered nurse. Mm -hmm. It sounds that that sounds so corny and super manny to me. The title. It is not co corny and super manny show. <laughs> She's dealing with intense things. I mean, yeah. there was the one that got me was the show where the mother was basically holding her son hostage. Well, she was she was keeping him confined to the house because she didn't want him to go. Mm -hmm. I I don't know the name of the show, the one where uh, she she did she didn't his clothes weren't in the closet so he couldn't leave. Yeah, and this is the Janet Dean uh, Jan, Janet Dean episode, right? I yeah, so this is, yeah. so uh, I guess I should explain to all listening. Janet Dean, Registered Nurse, was a show that, that Joan Harrison produced, and it starred a Lorraine, so again, kind of her her screen counterpart. It was the same thing, the other one I caught was Journey to the Unknown. Mm -hmm. They actually have like a, a black mass in this thing. <laughs> I, and, and, and that did, I know that was in the U, filmed in the UK, so this is an anthology show like a horror anthology filmed in the UK, but they also showed this in the US in a yeah. fashion. So so what what struck you about her television career? Like, what did you find interesting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think, well, I think the Janet Dean episode you're referring to, it may have been the pilot as well, if I'm remembering. Was that the, the veteran, the war veteran? that? Yes. That the, yeah, um, which I think is also interesting. It's the, it's the one that they went with first as well um, yeah. Um, but it yeah i mean those episodes were dealing with you know serious issues whether they were you know sociological or psychological sometimes really cultural um you know tensions and they often you know looking back in hindsight they seem to us probably rather you know maybe a little bit conservative or you know kind of a, a treatment where at the end you know well gosh, everything sure did work out okay, so I, I guess society is just getting along fine. 
<laughs> but the the things that they opened up were really on television, you know, kind of prime time television. So, and they were, you know, the show was financed by by Lawrence Rockefeller, basically simply because Ella Rain wanted to make it. And so in that way, it was like a blank slate for for Ella Rain and Joan Harrison to do what they what they wanted in the mid 1950s, which was a relatively concern, you know, as we know, right, pretty conservative time. Unfortunately, we don't have that many episodes. I mean, there are only four or five episodes uh, that we know of at all to be um, extant. And then on, I think on the internet, we really only can find two or three. Uh, yeah, I think I, ma I only managed to find two. There was one with a very young Saul Minio, mm -hmm. which I, I thought was also interesting. That They're both worth searching out. Yeah. That Journey to the Unknown is also, I mean, by the time you get to the to 1970, which is when that show is coming out, it's, it's getting much more toward like the Stanley Kubrick aesthetic, you know, where mm -hmm. everything feels much more psychedelic and much more avant-garde. And the themes that Joan Harrison looks to be interested in are, you know, have to do with race and, and um, you know, much more transgressive in terms of, of gender and uh, uh, I just, I, I just find it fascinating. By that time, she's in her sixties, and she's still pushing, you know, very much pushing the edge. If there's anybody who should have worked through the seventies, mm -hmm. I mean that that really, in a way, was her aesthetic. Though, though she did mold noir in, in a way too. There was one show that I own. There was one show that I was only able to catch a bit of, and I wondered if you'd caught any full episodes. It was a, a crime show with Ralph Bellamy, Yvette Mamou, and, oh, I forgot his name. It's called The Most Deadly Game? Yeah. Uh, yeah, The Most Deadly Game is is, is a, like a spy show, and it, honestly, I actually haven't been able to see very much of that either. Just uh, kind of clips here and there, but that was for Aaron Spelling, and... It's a great, I think it's almost like a precursor to, to me, like, to, it's more like Charlie's Angels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah the um, one, the but, clip I caught with, with Bellamy talking to the two of them, it really did seem like that vibe a lot, yeah. Yeah. And I know that television was a place for Yvette Mamou to, there was a place for her to, to have stronger roles, to, to, to lose some of that passivity she had on the big screen. And I, I thought, wow. If the two of them were together, I think it would have been similar to Reigns, if not exactly the same. Yeah, that's a good point. I think you're right. So what do you consider to be, like, if, if you wanted somebody to understand who Joan Harrison was, what in her career would be, like, the key films that somebody should watch? Yeah, so, I mean, I think to, you know, it would be really important to see something um, from the Hitchcock, you know, like something that she did with Hitchcock, although not to dwell too much on, um, not, you know, not to go back and watch every single film that she made with him that they collaborated on. But, you know, I think Rebecca is a really great example. I always bring up Rebecca as something that has Joan Harrison kind of written all over it because she worked on that film just for years and years. And so just in terms of the way that we see, you know, that, that female character played by Joan Fontaine as being so kind of so insecure yet trying to find herself and, and it really is so much about character which is what Joan, Joan Harrison cared about kind of character in relation to environment I would definitely recommend Rebecca if you were if you wanted to if you wanted to see one more Hitchcock film I for me Young and Innocent which is one that most people don't necessarily watch is another one 1937 hmm. The, the British film Young and Innocent, but then also, even though we've been talking about all these other, you know, all these other goodies, which are fabulous, I, I think you just got to go with Phantom Lady, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because I think that that was the film that she felt, um, you know, that was like the essence, right, of, for Joan Harrison, it, it was going to be her make or break film, and I think as like that feminist twist on the investigation, you know, on the wrong man yeah. slash, you know, slash female investigative thriller. That's a great way to find, find out, you know, who Joe Harrison was. I agree because I think that's how it happened for me. But, uh -huh. but what it was, was Ella Raines. Right. Like Phantom Lady led me to the strange affair of Uncle Harry. Ah. And I had no idea. That she, I, I, you know, you don't go looking at a producer 
credit unless it's an incredibly famous producer and there aren't as many compared to like a director right right so it's just it's funny to me that this was sneaking beneath the surface you know all these years this this wonderful creator i wonder do you, do you have a theory as to how much uncredited writing she was doing because nocturne really felt like it had her voice yeah yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely certain that every single film that she produced, she was deeply involved in the writing, you know? And so, you know, Ride the Pink Horse is a great example of this because, oh gosh, who's credited on that? Um, amazing writers, right? We've got... Oh, Ben Hecht. Yes. Charles Letter. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. I actually I didn't, hadn't checked yeah, yeah. that. She was happy to have Ben Hecht and Charles Letter. They're just top notch, and they've been writing, you know, together and also separately for for a really long time. And they could put a particular voice into the script. But she had been working on adapting Dorothy Hughes's novel for *Ride the Pink Horse* for months and months yeah. before they came in. So she'd really done the architecture for that film. And then, you know, it's not to say that they that those two had nothing to do with it. It's just that. It would be wrong to say that Joan Harrison, you know, had nothing to do with <laughs> with the writing. She was definitely involved. And I think the thing about her as a producer, there are different kinds of producers. Her role as a producer was to constantly kind of guide and coach and mentor the writers, even probably during production, you know, so that the script would be kind of evolving during production. Yeah, and so definitely during they won't be, again, every single script that she was producing, she had she had and I, I think it's, it's a testament to the fact that she had both artistic and, and kind of managerial skills that, that, that she could do it all. This is not just remarkable for a woman. This is remarkable for a, a filmmaker. Yes. She just w yeah. was one of those special people. I, I think that's why, why the, the book is so important because it, it, it's about somebody who, who it was unique and and important in the history of film because of that mix of talents and, and what it brought is is a collaboration and is her independent you know spirit too yeah i think you're right and and you know to to also make the point that she could do all of these things she could bring in screenplays or she could bring in film and she had kind of the creative side and the you know the artistic side as well as the business side but she was also so good at, at not uh, flaunting that right so she mm -hmm. she was a people person so she was never going to show off that she was, she was never going to flaunt that she was involved with the writing of a script. You know what I'm saying? She would mm -hmm. always kind of downplay her own. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that she wasn't, some people would certainly, I, I know that people described her as strong-willed and as, you know, having uh, her own say. And I, I love yeah. this line that I got in an interview from Anne Blythe when I, you know, I was, fortunate enough just to speak to her on the phone because she, um, she was in a comedy, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, with Joan Harrison. And then I asked her something like, like, what was it like to work with Joan Harrison? And she said, oh, well, I don't really know, but I know that if she didn't like me, she sure, she, she sure would have let me know. <laughs> <you> know? <laughs> and so I'm sure that, I'm sure that Harrison had a hard edge to her, yeah. but she wasn't the kind of person that would walk around as like a diva, you know? Yeah, yeah. She, she was into the role of just like put your head down and get the work done. But when I step back and I look at the kind of producer that she was, I mean, the, you know, really, if she hadn't been a woman, I think she was like, hey, I, I would like to be David O'Selznick. I would rather not be working for David O'Selznick. And she could have been. Yeah. You know? Yeah, she could have been the best at it, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. This has just been so fascinating. And your book is so fascinating. I really appreciate you getting this story out there. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. For show notes, including information about Christina's book, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. Thank you for listening. This is Kendall Kruver watching classic movies. Until next time.